early in my teaching career, I really wanted to be an ed tech coordinator, whether that was working for the provincial government in Alberta, doing that at the district level. And there was actually one time I remember getting an interview for that position with a school district. I walked into the interview room and there is a table of about 10 people sitting around this table and is not something I ever experienced before. And what happened in that interview was every person would ask me one question and they would make no facial expressions. They wouldn't say anything to me. I would give them the answer. They would give me no feedback. There was no conversation. And that was it. That was how the interview went. It was just a question. I would provide an answer, move on to the next question. And I remember that process walking out of there feeling sick because it just didn't feel right. There was something wrong with it. But I also knew I probably wasn't going to get the job because the longer that process went on, the, the worse it felt for me. And so, of course, they called me, said I didn't get it. And I was absolutely destroyed about that. That was something I really, really wanted so bad. Fast forward a couple of years, I actually ended up getting a position as an assistant principal. And it's kind of a different route to go into school administration as an assistant principal or principal rather than into the ed technology, um, educational technology area. And I felt the second I started that job, it was something I truly was meant to do. And although I was really frustrated with not getting that job and I was bothered by it and felt, you know, my life would be better if I got this job, I didn't dwell on it. I got back up and I just continued to do my best every single day. And eventually you do your best every single day. Things that you don't even know are meant for you seem to happen. And that's something that really, really matters to me. And when I was talking to Sarah Painter, the teacher of the year in Florida in 2022, she's absolutely amazing. I said this um, and I wasn't joking. She has a certain way about her. She's just got a great energy because no matter what comes her way, she always seems to find a pathway forward, whether it's a good opportunity, whether it's not a great opportunity, she makes the best out of it. She understands here's what the situation is. Here's how I deal with it. I, always, I was thinking about Trevor Moad's um, book about neutral thinking is that what's the next best thing I could do in the situation and Sarah really embodies that so as you're listening to her she does she has an amazing story about running why it really matters how it makes her a better teacher but she also talks about some of the things that very vulnerable moment she talked about why she was disappointed with a job she didn't get and through that experience she actually ended up getting something that has been totally amazing with her. And I know because she's doing such a great job, so many doors will open for her as she continues doing this because it just seems to happen. When you put your best foot forward every single day, even when it's sometimes the things you don't want to happen, sometimes things will find you that you weren't expecting. And I really thought about that in Sarah's um, stories. I could go on and on. Absolutely amazing podcast. I know you're going to love it. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, this is George Kroos. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I am so blessed and I just, we just sat down and talked, you know, for probably 40 minutes, recorded 10, 15 minutes uh, to have Sarah Painter. She was the Florida Teacher of the Year in 2022. I, I met with her in a, a recent event and just absolutely phenomenal teacher, incredible idea. Uh, also energy, like you just have, you. and I'm not like, I'm not saying you're, spunky or anything like that it's just am i oh i'm gonna sound like i'm going crazy aura, going oh. aura. <laughs> is that weird like you just have like you have a good energy and it just you yeah. know i feel that really really matters right that you know it people really does. Yeah. You. and so yeah, the kid, kids are the first ones to pick up on that they know they are kids and dogs yeah <laughs> and i know <laughs> you're a new a new <laughs> dog person dogs dogs do pick up dogs do pick it up right if you're if my yeah. dog doesn't like someone it's like oh so what's going yeah. on there thumbs up my dog knows that stuff so uh i i actually sarah uh teacher of the year as i mentioned doing some incredible things but instead of me telling you that tell everyone who you are what you do today and how you got there i think it's a great place to start sure hi everyone i am sarah painter i am the 2022 florida teacher of the year but prior to that <laughs> um and i and i just say always about that I am not the best teacher in the state of Florida. I represent the best that's happening in the state of Florida. Mm -hmm. So I promised my colleagues anytime I would go out and speak or visit schools that I would bring them with me. And so whenever I 
did travel and speak, I made sure I pointed to the amazing things happening, not only in my district in Pinellas County, but through my travels, I would say, oh my gosh, you teach music. You need to connect with so-and-so in Osceola County. So I just want to make sure everyone understands. I do not think I'm the greatest teacher in the state of Florida. You don't have like a championship belt or anything like that? No, not at all. I would, I would ask for one right away. A gold medal. Um, but I did start as a third grade teacher. I taught third grade for five years. Um, my school closed. It was a very old building and to save money, they closed my school. And I was placed at the school I'm at now and I was placed in fourth grade. So I went from third to fourth and I absolutely loved it. I felt like the older the kids were, the more they were able to do. I had a little bit more fun with my sarcasm. They got my jokes. <laughs> um, and I taught fourth grade for eight years. And then I had this magical one year that I decided to loop up with them. So I took my fourth graders and I became their fifth grade teacher. It was one of the most phenomenal decisions of my life because I wasted no time that next year. I could start with instruction immediately. I had connections with families. It was a very, very beautiful thing um, that year. So I stayed in fifth grade for about six years. I was named the 2021 Pinellas County Teacher of the Year and then 2022 Florida Teacher of the Year. I went on a year-long sabbatical. Um, from the Department of Education in Florida that allows me to travel and advocate for our profession and to speak to students in college that want to become teachers, visit schools, and, and just really gather new evidences to add to my layers to bring back to Pinellas County. And so when I came back to my county, I had felt a shift in my heart. And of course, I'm always for students. We know that. But I had a heart now for my colleagues. I saw the stresses that my colleagues were dealing with, and I knew people were leaving the profession. And so I shifted to become an instructional coach. I was an MTSS coach. And that allowed me to support my colleagues, especially the year I became MTSS coach. Um, was the year we adopted new standards and we had a new statewide assessment. Mm. And so my job became um, reading those reports and then showing my teachers how to read those reports and use them to drive instruction. So I did MTSS coaching for two years. And this year I am the proud ESOL teacher at Eisenhower Elementary. I am working with our English language learners, particularly in third grade and collaborating with the third grade teachers as we plan lessons and scaffolds to help create equity and access across our curriculum. Okay, so there's a couple of things I wanna ask you about. Okay. The first one, you and I don't know if I should say this, we'll cut it out if I- Okay. <laughs> But you, you said you like, at first you were like, not necessarily excited about, and then you told me it's like amazing. So right. why, like, and I, I actually, it's funny because some of the things that I wanted to teach the least, I actually ended up loving the most yeah. that, you know, and it wasn't, it had nothing it ever had to do with students. And I, I'm, I know that a hundred percent about you. It was like, I can't, I don't know what I'm doing there. Or like, I'm, and then you kind of get into it. And I felt sometimes it was really kind of pushing my brain that I had to like really challenge myself to kind of figure this out. I'm like, I'm like, I'm barely ahead of the students, right. <laughs> what I'm doing here. So it was really like, I really engaged in that. So like, wh what did you find that you've really loved teaching yeah, think, this year? Yeah, my reservations were I'm, I'm eager to become an administrator. So I have my ed leadership degree, I am positioned to be ready but it just didn't work out during this timing. And so I felt like I didn't have a choice in where I was placed this year. And honestly, if I'm being transparent, it felt like a step back. Mm -hmm. I had been out of the classroom now for three years. So I had to get out of my own way and swallow my pride. And what I have found is now I'm able to implement all those things I saw around the state. Where before I was working with teachers and, and coaching them to implement it, I get to do that. I'm the driver. And I forgot how much I get to be in charge of decisions when I am in a classroom with students. And all the best practices that I was doing in my gen ed, fifth grade, fourth grade, third grade class, I'm able to do those with my ESOL students, but even more because there's so much innovation with that. We have technology at our fingertips that didn't exist the last time I was in the classroom. I mean, you're talking about just three years ago. So um, I'll give you an example. The other day I pushed into a third grade classroom and in that classroom, we have three zero language students, which means they barely know any English. All three happen to be Spanish. So they each have an iPad. I put a document that had a chapter summary of the novel 
that their fellow third grade students are reading. It had the chapter summary in Spanish. It was a little bit shorter. So I put it in immersive reader and I had it reading to them in Spanish. I used Google Translate on my phone to ask them comprehension questions. They dictated their answers into their iPads in Spanish, translated it to English, turned it around and showed it to me. And when they got it right, Alejandro jumped up and down and I had goosebumps on my arms. Now that didn't happen every day in a Gen Ed classroom. So I think it's the reward of seeing the light bulbs, the aha moments, the um, someone's talking to me and allowing me to have a voice when just 10 minutes ago, I may not have had it. That's the beautiful thing that I wasn't expecting. So, you know, there's a, okay. There's actually a quote from me. <laughs> so, <laughs> What, ego? what are you talking about? No, listen, and it is like, you are the totally like exemplified this. It's absolutely. So, so I talk about this all the time. Te I say technology will never place great teachers, but in the hands of great teachers, technology is transformational. Yes. And, and it's really like some of this, I'm listening to you. I'm like, like I, you know, a lot of people feel I'm a tech guy. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Where are you figuring all this stuff out? So like, it's amazing all the access, but only if you leverage it, right? Like Absolutely. you can have all the tools in the world, but if you don't leverage it, and I feel that that's part of the importance of education is seeing some of these things, not just dismissing them, they're either good or bad, but really how we think about how we utilize them to like your first year of teaching, what were, what would you have done? Do you know, do you know what I mean? Like it would have been, it's kind of like I travel all the time and I always think about this. I could have got nowhere without Google Maps. Like, how did people do this before yes. before me? Yes. And I, you know, I guess I could have opened. I I can't open up a map. It doesn't make any sense to me. But it, mm -hmm. like, it's kind of like it's a language for a lot of people. And I don't. That's maps are not a language I speak. So so it kind of opens some doors. So I just I love that that you see the power and there's no way you knew that right. Like you know you you pick that up as you go. And, and they showed me. So like I brought them in to dictate into the iPad. They showed me that they could translate it to English so I could read it. But what's even more powerful is then I empowered them. And today the fourth and fifth grade zero language students got their iPads. And rather than the classroom teacher show them how to use them, I went and grabbed my zero language third graders, my little ones, and had them go in and show the students how to use them rather than us selling them. And I'm telling you, they were terrified when I translated and I said, I want you to go show fourth and fifth graders how to use this. They were like, not me. I was like, but you know how. And so they did. And they're in there modeling in their native language how to use this technology. And now it's not on me or the classroom teacher. The students have now taken ownership of that. And now they're showing their friends how to use it. And I know tomorrow they're going to come back and show me something I had no idea they could do. You know, they're like taking pictures of the text. And with the Google Lens, the picture then translates it into their native language. And they can now read the same novel that we're reading. So there's, I'm reading a book right now, and you've mentioned uh, it's Adam Grant's, I can't remember the whole title, but it's Hidden Potential, and there's some subtitle. It's I highly recommend the book. It's very, very good. And it is so much about learning and development. And there's two things that you talked about. And I, I, have you read that book? Have you read it? No. You would love it, just based on what you just talked about right now. So uh, one of them is uh, basically one of the best things to help kids learn is to get them to coach. So mm -hmm. if you have to coach somebody to do something, then you have to know it inside out. And I quote, I always share in my keynotes, uh, Joseph Joubert is to teach us to learn twice. And really that you're exemplifying. So he talks about that and, and shifts it. The other one too, and I thought it was really interesting. And you kind of, you kind of talked about it. They're talking about in Finland, um, it's considered one of the best education systems in the world. And there's, there's a lot of factors, but one of the things he talked about and it's kind of like, oh, have you tried relationships? There's all that conversation and education. And I'm like, well, actually, like if you don't build relationships, I'm not saying best friends with kids or anything like that, but like knowing your students, knowing, and you know, he talked about knowing their families. He said, one of the things that Finland does that is really separate is looping. And yeah. actually, you know, these kids. And so the fear is, because I actually was in a school community that um, did looping. And there is always like a fear that like you would, be stuck with a family and there's just a personality conflict. And so it's not like you have to get through a year. It's like three or four. Mm -hmm. So I'll be honest with you. We all, if that ever happened, we figured it out. Like we always figured it out, whether sometimes like, Hey, 
maybe this is not a best fit. So maybe this student will go here. And it wasn't like, let's kick them out. It was like a conversation with the family conversation with the school. So like, why, why do you feel, and like, from your perspective, kind of going through that looping process, why, why did you find it so beneficial? I think because um, the, the connections with the families for sure, but it was connections with the students and all that learning you do about each other. Like, and I mean, like learning about your way of work. So how long does it take me to learn the best environment for a student? That can take weeks to months sometimes if I don't get one-on-one -on -one time with them. But if I have had it figured out, you know, by May of the previous year, then now you're talking about starting in August, knowing that Adrian she wants to sit in the front during math and she loves to show her her work doing doodles. So right. where I might start with a brand new student that doodles when I do math and I'll say, you know, you can't doodle. I need you to take notes. But I know Adrian's doodling because that's how Adrian processes. I've cut out that time. We just had more time to learn, more time to have fun. We There was no wasted time. And the kids, the culture that gets created in a room come May, right? Like, mm -hmm. You always start the next year going, I wish I had what I had in May. Right, right. I got that. Like I was able to start with that. And so that was just something I'd always wanted. And I had this crazy dream that if one year I could go down to third, loop to fourth, and then loop to fifth. Like that would have been my dream. And who knows? It could still happen. That's that's amazing. You know, so you're talking about this. I actually talked with a a former, he was never my student, but I coached him on the basketball team. So I actually coached high school basketball, but taught elementary school. And I was talking to him. He's actually coming down to Orlando for a conference. So we reconnected because he'll come, you know, visit me. And uh, I said, hey, say hi to your sister, Shiloh. Uh, and and it was funny. I said, just a reminder, because that was my very first year teaching, that she hated me for the first seven months. It took her about seven months to start liking me. Just a reminder that. And he's, he just started laughing. Cause he knew it was true. Like she was like, you know, like it took a while for her. And I wish I would have had like another year with right. her right. because it took her, you know, take some kids to, to warm up and Absolutely. to do this. And you know, by the end, I, she, she loved me and she actually reached out to me recently too. And you know, but it was like, I she probably doesn't remember, but I remember it took her like a long time. But if I would have yeah. had her for another year, then that all that would have been on the way. And probably there was some right. of that. It, it wasn't her, right? Like she's in grade four. It's probably yeah. like, you know, she, you know, as a big sports guy, she probably didn't really care about it, whatever. And that's, you know, we, we talked about that. You know, sometimes it was like all about me at the beginning of the year because I didn't know what I was doing. So I had to kind of make it about me. Um, but that that's something that I really, really connected. Now, you, you shared a story with me before. Um, I've really focused on my fitness over the last several years. And I, I actually have always kind of focused on my fitness. But probably, you know, a combination of like eating healthier and my fitness kind of because it was like, I'm going to try to like beat my horrible eating habits and you just can't win when, for me anyways at a certain age. But you talked about you started running during COVID and you really, it's really empowered you. And so tell about, I want to know about that story, but I also want to know how running has made you a better teacher. So I'm like, because sure. I think a lot of people... I think there's I, I think there's a connection there too and i know that there's probably you know kind of fulfilled you some way so tell a little bit about your running story yeah so um i've shared with you george i am a mom of six kids and so um through that journey there aren't a lot of things that i get to do that take me out of the house that i don't have a child that wants to go with me and so I, I always share that it, I think it started as one day I said, I'm going to go run to Publix, but I never got the words to Publix out of my mouth. When my children heard I was going to go run, nobody volunteered to go with me. So I just put a period on it. And I was like, sure, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> and so, you know, I took my phone outside. I think I played Candy Crush around the corner and I like jogged back to the door. And, you know, that was my first run. Uh -huh. But it did eventually evolve into a passion. And so um, I decided in January, January 1st, 2020, that I would um, challenge myself to run at least one mile outdoors every single day. And I chose outdoors. One, I don't have a treadmill or go to a gym. But two, there's just something about being outside. I feel like the moment I step outside into nature, my blood pressure lowers. Mm -hmm. um, but I also found that running was my processing time. 
And so as a mom of six and a full-time teacher and a wife and a, and a sister and a daughter, you know, there wasn't a lot of time that I, I was able to process my day until I was too exhausted and fall asleep. Mm -hmm. So I started my running streak in January. And then in March of spring break was when we were sent home and we did not return. Mm -hmm. And so while I could have easily made that an excuse and stopped my running, I had students um, who were aware of my running streak. They knew what I was doing. And so I couldn't let them down. And so I continued to run. I would teach live in the morning and have all of my kids virtually log on. We'd break for lunch. I'd go run my mile. I'd come back all sweaty in my in my running clothes and get back on after lunch for math. And they'd say, did you get your run done? And I'd say, yes, I did. <laughs> and so we talked about streaking, if you will. Right. And, and I encouraged them to choose anything that they don't do consistently that they wish they did. I said, for some, it's brushing your teeth. Like then when you start counting your days in a row, you don't want to go back to zero. Mm -hmm. And I said, what is it that you need to continue to do that if you just started counting it consecutively, it would motivate you to keep doing. And so for me, it was running. And so I would go out running, but I found that I would use my um, stories that happened while I was running as teaching analogies for my students. So, you know, I'm running and my shoelace comes untied and I stop and tie it. So the next day I would go into my class and I'd say, you know, sometimes in life, your plans get interrupted, but you stop what you're doing, you address the problem and then you get right back up right? Or um, it's getting ready to rain and, and I'm going out for my run. And in Florida, it rains, you know, all the time. Yeah. So I have two choices. I can break my running streak or I can run in the rain. And so what do I do? I, I choose to run in the rain. And, and so I do that because my passion didn't change. My mission didn't waver because the weather changed. I made a commitment and I, and I hold myself to that. You talk a lot about, George, keeping commitments to yourself and keeping appointments with yourself. That's what running is to me. Mm. But I equate it to the teaching profession too, because I think teaching can be like that for us. It can be that thing we have decided we're going to do come hell or high water, come rain or shine, because at the end of the day, it's the students that we are showing up for, not our circumstances. And so when I think about running, I, I prioritize it to the point that I would not ever not do it. It's funny, I, I shared once in one of my keynotes when someone asked me, what do you mean by prioritize it? I said, I know when I say that you think, okay, yeah, make it a priority. But I, I asked them, you know, on, on fist to five, how important is it that you brush your teeth every day? And so we'll have some four, some, some people might say three, you know, there might be a day you don't or wash your hair, right? But if I say, how important is it to put on a pair of pants or bottoms before you leave the house to go to work? It's a five every time. Mm -hmm. Nobody leaves their house without rearranging something to make sure that happens if it wasn't going to happen. That's running for me. Huh. I will rearrange my schedule. I will plan it out so that it happens. And if it doesn't happen the time or the place I needed it to, I'll think about ways to be innovative to make it happen. And I think that's how teaching can be for us, too. If we have committed for the right reasons, it doesn't matter what legislation passes, what curriculum our district mm -hmm. adopts, right? Like you do it because you've decided to do it, not because all the conditions were right for it. So that's kind of like what running is for me. It's my processing time. It's my commitment to myself. But it's also my example to my students that we can do hard things. This is like, this is your when you reclaim your Florida teacher of the year title, <laughs> I feel this is the acceptance speech right there. Yeah. That was it. Can you get it more than once? Cause like, I feel <laughs> I like, mean, I, don't, I, don't. I feel like you, that's your time. That's your, your speech right there. That's a, and you know, like all of those things with your brain, I, you not you never talk about this. I will not, when I go to speak to groups, I will not speak to them. And, and I, if I have to get up at three in the morning, I will, cause if I don't mm -hmm. run, I'm worse and I yeah. it like the sweat. I don't know if it gets my brain going, things like that too. <laughs> and like, seriously though, right? It's the secret sauce. It really is. It helps me so much, but also the modeling to your students. I, you know, and we talked about how being a whole person, you know, not, yes. and I, I, I just wrote, I met, I can't remember if I mentioned this in the first, second post, I wrote about not only a teacher is that yeah. we are so much more and our profession, but all those things really, really matter and make a difference. So I like, I'm sitting here, I'm like, this is, I'm, this was this a teacher year speech? Was this it? Cause like, we got to win it again. 
You got to win it again. So we give that speech. It was so inspiring. So I loved it. But Sarah, hey, I know you took time on your day. It's the end of your school day. You spent here. Did you get your run in today? Like, have I? Not yet. I'm do it oh, after. no. Oh, no. Maybe. It's okay. I, right now. Maybe I should like have you on this like a marathon podcast and then I'll ruin your streak. As long as I get it in before midnight, we're good. <laughs> okay. Well, hey, Sarah, I hope everyone connects with Sarah. Absolutely inspiring. I can't wait to see you more in person. Please say hi to everyone in Pinellas County to me. And if you're super tenant, follows me on Twitter. Just give them a hard time. You got it. <laughs> All right. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening, Sarah. It was absolutely amazing to listen to you. Have a wonderful day.